Much of the 9th and 10th century was a period of resurgence for Byzantium. The Byzantines made slow but steady gains along their eastern frontier pretty much throughout this period with very few interruptions. They also made some gains in the Balkans for the most part, although that was a much more mixed affair. One area where they did quite poorly, however, was in their Aegean heartland. There, the prosperity and safety of Byzantine citizens and trade was gravely threatened by Arab pirates based out of Crete. Naturally enough, it was a leading priority of Byzantine statesmen for about 140 years to destroy the emirate, but it was only in 961 when this was accomplished. Naturally enough, this was a major strategic victory for Byzantium, and it contributed greatly to renewed prosperity and yet more expansion going forward. In this video, what I want to do is look at this event in its full context and also discuss the Emirate of Crete and other related issues. What I hope to show in this video is that the capture of Crete is a significant event in Byzantine history, which in a lot of ways helped to pave the way for the great victories of Nicephorus Phocas, John Semiskis, and Basil II the Bulgar Slayer. At one point, I strongly considered doing an entire video dedicated to the Emirate of Crete, but then as I gathered information, I realized that there wasn't much of a story there, although it was still something that I found to be intriguing. Let's look at the Emirate of Crete, and I think you'll understand why I didn't end up making an entire video on the subject. In 824, or possibly a few years later, in 827 to 28, exiles from Al-Andalus affected the conquest of Crete and established an emirate on the island. These were political exiles who had lost a bid for the throne. They spent several years in North Africa, and then they sailed for Crete and managed to conquer the island. This emirate became mostly known for raiding Byzantine coastal areas, and most of our accounts of it are from hostile Byzantine sources who for understandable reasons, had a very negative opinion of this particular state. The Muslim population which settled um, on Crete was never more than a minority, and they were just kind of a ruling class element. However, the lack of native revolt suggests that they were able to establish some degree of harmony with the Christian majority, and that for the most part, things were functional in their society. It seems to have been a fairly well-functioning state, as it should have been given the amount of wealth that kept flowing in. They were able to mint standardized high-quality gold and silver currency. Later Arab sources, this would have been at least 100 years after the fall of the emirate, claim that the emirate of Crete was a prosperous trade center and also a center of learning. Now we know that it most likely was a prosperous trade center since Crete is well situated between the Byzantine and the Islamic worlds at that time, but we have no real way to know if it actually was a center of learning. Usually when you have a lot of prosperity that does engender learning, but we don't really know of any great Arab scholars who hailed from Crete or studied there so it might just be a bit of romanticism on the part of this later writer who was lamenting the fall of this long dead emirate. At any rate though, um, the Emirate of Crete did serve a pretty valuable function for the Islamic world, and it did serve as a fairly major check on Byzantine power. Due to all of the devastation that the Emirate of Crete had wrought upon the Byzantine world, both through its own actions and through the actions of its allies who had much easier access to the Aegean Sea, the Byzantines were determined to capture Crete, and this was a high priority every time the Byzantines were able to assemble a large naval force and spare troops from the frontiers. Um, the biggest event which really put this on the priority list, at least the most notable and dramatic event, would have been the sack of Thessalonica in 904. That was actually affected by Leo of Tripoli, who sailed out of Syria, but had it not been for the Emirate of Crete being in place, it would have been much harder for him to slip his fleet into the home waters of the Byzantine Empire. In the 820s, in 843, in 866, in 911, and again in 949, 
there were Byzantine expeditions which had tried and failed to reconquer Crete. Most of those were a little bit underfunded and undermanned, but some of them had to be withdrawn for political reasons um, or power struggles back at home. So some of these could have succeeded had things gone a little differently, but of course they did not. The last expedition had been in 949. This had been ordered by Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus, and he had ordered it. He also still had a great interest in it at the time of his death. He was responsible for organizing, at least in the early phases, the expedition that we're talking about today. He also wrote about his preparations in some of his surviving works. The work in question actually is on ceremonies. As Byzantine historian Anthony Caldellus said, and he said it well enough that I can only quote it, every generation knew its Cretan debacle. By this point in Byzantine history, they probably took it as a given that capturing Crete would be a great thing for them, and this would be something that would be greatly beneficial to their future, but that their chances of actually pulling it off were not very good. So Constantine, however, was apparently an optimist. He, after all, had survived the reign of his father-in-law. So maybe he figured if he could survive that, he could also conquer Crete. But unfortunately for him, his health ended up conquering him. So he did not live to see this expedition launched or live to see its outcome. Let us consider the major political players in this drama. First of all, let's look at the two opposing rulers. On the one hand, you have the Emir of Crete in 960. He has a very, very long name, but fortunately the Byzantines decided to give him a nickname, Korupas. And Korupas is effectively a Hellenization of the al Kortubi part of his name, which means something like the Man of Cordoba. I imagine for Korupas that would have been a somewhat confusing name since he and his family had not actually lived in Iberia since about 810 or so, give or take, maybe a little bit more recently than that, but not by much. Karupas had come to the throne in 949, so he was relatively well established in power. His, immediately, his immediate predecessor was his uncle Ali. Karupas also had a son named Animas. He was designated as his heir. Animas was probably already an adult, or at least he could not have been too far removed from adulthood, since we know that he was an adult who served in a campaign in about 971. On the Byzantine side of things, we have Romanus II, Constantine's son and heir. Unlike many Byzantine emperors, he had come to the throne peacefully, and he had been well trained for his position. He was in his early 20s, and he shared his father's enthusiasm for this campaign. He seems to have taken a fairly active role in planning this campaign, although he did not accompany the expedition. So he was quite involved. There also are some accounts, as we'll see, that say that he played an important role in the diplomacy leading up to this campaign. Another major player on the Byzantine side was Romanus II's right-hand man, Joseph Bringas. Bringas was a eunuch who had risen to prominence late in the career of Constantine VII. He had become the Parakoi Mormonos in place of the elderly Basil Lecopinus. And this new eunuch administrator is portrayed as someone who was a major pusher of this campaign. As we'll see, even though he was not present during the campaign, he will be an important part of its success even from afar. As we'll see in a minute, the Byzantine force assembled in 960 was a massive expedition and it entailed a great deal of risk. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that the Byzantine authorities spent a great deal of time deciding who would command this massive force. As late as 958, it appears that one of the candidates for command was actually Basil Lecopinus. Now, Basil was the eunuch son of the former emperor Romanus I. He had been out of favor for a while, but later in Constantine VII's reign, Basil had managed to win back his brother-in-law's trust and had become a senior official. 
He also had won a few battles in his own right. In 958, he'd actually won a victory against Saif al Dola at Semosada. And he was in the running, apparently. There was a book dedicated on tactics, and this book had an anonymous author who actually dedicated his work to Basil Lycopinus and said that he hoped that one day soon Basil would conquer Crete, which, you know, is, I think, a pretty reasonably strong piece of evidence that Basil was in consideration. However, Basil was getting up there in age, and the name Lycopinus is one that you probably don't want to allow to accrue too much shine. And even if he had won over Constantine VII, that favor did not necessarily extend to the people who succeeded him. Once Romanus II and Bringas were firmly in power, Romanus II opted to reassign Nicephorus Phocas from his command in the east, where he had been doing excellent work, and entrusted him instead with the Cretan expedition. It's very likely that Romanus II, who was a real enthusiast of this campaign, wanted to make sure that his very best man was on the job, and that is probably a wise choice when you consider the kind of risk that the Byzantines were taking by sending such a massive force to Crete and stripping bare some of their frontier armies, but we'll come back to that. As for Nicephorus Phocas, he came from a family which at this time was the foremost military family in all of Byzantium. His grandfather and namesake had done great work in southern Italy and had really arrested the progress of the Saracens of Sicily. His father um, and uncle had both been prominent generals. His uncle had actually failed in a competition with Romanus Lycopinus to seize the Byzantine throne in 920. His father, Bardos, had been a highly successful general, at least successful in the sense of getting himself a major command, and then Nicephorus had inherited that command from his father when the old man had retired. In the last several years, Nicephorus Phocas had proven himself to be far better than his father had ever been, and he also had a brother named Leo who had also done some excellent work by this point and would continue to shine in subsequent years. Nicephorus Phocas, despite being a brilliant and proven commander, was also known for being prickly, ascetic, and generally kind of difficult to deal with on a personal level. The struggle for Crete was fascinating and also very important. That's something that was not lost on medieval sources. Unfortunately, one thing that never really interested medieval sources, or at least didn't interest them enough from a modern perspective, is just how many men were actually engaged. Unfortunately, we have no concrete numbers for either side. For the Emirate of Crete, we know only that it had a somewhat smallish but high-quality army and navy. The navy would have been the better of the two, since that was what they were primarily known for, their raids and piracy. But, as we'll see, the navy would not end up playing a role in this conflict. The Byzantine force of 960 was massive, but unfortunately we don't know exactly how massive. Anthony Caldellus speculates that this force may have been twice the size of the 949 expedition, but of course that is just a guess. What we do know for certain is that the Byzantines drew contingents from just about every theme in the empire. And the effect of that is that by taking away so many of the high-quality mobile troops and leaving mostly garrison troops, the Byzantines consigned themselves to a purely defensive setting in both Europe and in Asia. Some of their enemies decided to take advantage, including the Magyars and the ever-industrious Saif al Dawla. Saif had been struggling previously, but he regained the initiative. He would make some progress, but then he'd find out the hard way that Nicephorus Phocas was not the only great general of his generation. The Magyars also had some problems, but we'll discuss all of that in a different video when we get to Nicephorus's reign. Nicephorus Phocas gathered his forces to the south of Ephesus and set sail for Crete on July 13, 960. There is at least one source which claims that Romanus II was able to allay the suspicion of the Cretans 
by engaging in negotiations with Karupas about possibly even paying a tribute to Crete to keep its navy out of Byzantine waters, and that this allayed Karupas' suspicions enough that he had no idea this attack was coming. Most likely that story is somewhat apocryphal, and Karupas would have caught wind of some of these Byzantine preparations. You simply can't move that many troops around without it gathering some attention. For the most part, though, most major Byzantine expeditions had been against the east, and I suppose if Nicephorus Phocas's name was known in connection to this expedition, it would be natural to assume that he was going to do something in Syria or Cilicia. So perhaps Karupas was taken by surprise, but most likely it was not because of Romanus II's diplomacy. For whatever reason, the Cretan fleet was not able or did not try to intercept this expedition. Um, I think a lot of people see this as a little more suspicious than it is or as proof of the success of this Byzantine ruse. The fact of the matter is that in ancient and medieval naval warfare, intercepting even a large invading fleet was a lot harder than you might think. Fleets had to stick very close to the coast, so there were a limited number of ways you could get places, but um, finding a fleet was still very difficult with navigational techniques, technological limits, and speeds of the day. So even if the Cretans were out in force looking for this expedition, there's a pretty good chance that they could have missed it legitimately. And that even applies to skilled navies like the Emirate of Crete had. So this is not just them engaging in amateur hour. So once Phocas does arrive in Crete, he lands his troops and marches straight at the Emirate's capital at Shandox, that is the modern city of Heraklion, pictured here. So Nicephorus Phocas wasted no time. If I had to hazard a guess as to why he went straight at Shandox, not only was this the capital, but since Crete was settled by a minority of Muslims who served as a ruling class, most likely this is where they were concentrated, so Nicephorus as a very ardent Christian could make sure that most of the devastation he would bring would be against people who did not share his religious convictions. So this was a way also to possibly avoid alienating the local Christians any more than might otherwise be the case if he were visiting destruction upon their homesteads. While Nicephorus Phocas did everything in his power to cut to the heart of the matter, the fact is that he was not going to win a quick decision at Shandox. This was a formidable city, well fortified and custom designed by the regime in Crete. The Byzantines, however, decided to resort to slaughtering civilians outside of the city walls, which forced them to take refuge in Shandox. Presumably what Nicephorus was thinking here is that by driving a bunch of civilians into the city, he could put a bigger strain on their food supply and shorten the siege. If so, this was a brutal but very smart tactic. Both sides, however, were ill-prepared to face the harsh winter of 960 to 961. And it appears that both sides suffered quite a bit over that winter. You would think that with all the preparations the Byzantines had made that their supply situation would be pretty safe, but apparently that wasn't the case because there were forces from the Emir who were raiding their supply lines, and then this winter happened to be quite a bit worse than had been expected. During the winter of 960 to 961, both Nicephorus Phocas and Karupas were counting very heavily on outside forces aiding their efforts. Despite empire-wide shortages that winter, Joseph Bringas had the administrative prowess to scrounge up enough supplies and get them through to Phocas, which helped his men avoid starvation. So Phocas would be able to mount an assault when the weather became much more favorable. For Karupas, his efforts ended up being less successful since he did not have the backing of a larger empire. Ostensibly, the Emirate of Crete owed its allegiance to the Abbasid Caliphate, but by this point, the Caliphate had really splintered and its effective authority was more or less in theory. 
One effective power who was nearby, however, was the Fatimid Caliph al-Mu'iz. Now this map is probably a little too generous to the Fatimids at this point, but he was quite powerful and could have helped quite a bit had he arrived in time. He was willing to aid his um, Cretan neighbor against the Byzantines, but it takes a long time to actually assemble a massive expedition to fight off the kind of force that Nicephorus Phocas had assembled. So by the time that he was anywhere near ready, it was too late and Crete had fallen. I hope that wasn't too much of a spoiler. Uh, I guess the title though probably gave it away that this is the Byzantine capture of Crete. But anyway, um, this is part of why the Byzantines were able to prevail is because the allies of the Emirate of Crete were simply not prepared to aid their neighbor. Unfortunately, numbers are not the only thing that is absent from our sources when it comes to understanding the Siege of Shandaks. In addition to not knowing how many men were engaged, we also don't have a clear chronological account of the siege. That being said, we do have a lot of little scattered references and hints about what happened. We know that both sides engaged in raiding the hinterlands of the other side. This would have been much more useful for the emir than for Phocas, however. And we also know that both sides would use ambushes to take out foragers from the opposing army. This, of course, would have also been more useful for the um, Emirate of Crete than it would have been for the Byzantines, since the Byzantines were more able to forage in the first place, and the forces of the Emirate would have been much more in tune with local geography. We don't know the name of this general, but one of Nicephorus's generals was actually slain in such an ambush, so these did have some effect on the besiegers. As for Nicephorus Phocas, he was deadly determined to capture the city at all cost. When he would capture Arab raiders who were affecting his supply situation, he would decapitate them and then catapult their heads into Shandaks in order to demoralize the garrison. Specifically, we're told, the relatives of the men whose heads were being thrown over. He wanted to personally reach out and let them know that their situation was hopeless and that they were doomed. Nicephorus Phocas was a pretty grim individual. However, he once made a joke, apparently. At one point during the siege, one of the Byzantine donkeys became crippled while it was still alive. Um, he decided that it would be funny to catapult it into the walls of Shandaks rather than putting it out of its misery. So the Byzantines put it on a catapult and shot it over. While it was flying through the air as awkwardly as one might imagine a donkey flying through the air would be, um, Nicephorus cracked to his men that it flew like an eagle. As far as I'm aware, that is the only time we have any evidence of Nicephorus Phocas ever trying to make a joke. By early March, the defenders had been weakened from a lack of supplies, and Phocas had recovered from the harsh winter. It was then that he decided to assault the city of Shandaks. He concentrated his catapult fire and also employed sappers, and by doing so, he was able to effect a breach in the fortifications. He might also have had ballistas or something of that nature. I don't know the exact nature of the siege equipment, but I know he must have had catapults because of what I told you earlier about him catapulting over the donkey and the heads of the slain Arab raiders. On March 6th or 7th of 961, the Byzantines were able to effect a breach and then fight through it. It was a hard fight, but the Byzantines were massively superior in numbers, and the defenders were probably quite worn down by hunger. This resulted in the usual amount of rapine which will accompany the fall of a city. It is very hard for any victorious general to keep control of his men after they've suffered through a long siege, and they will run wild for days on end, sometimes up to a week before the commanding officer is able to establish order and discipline. Um, this resulted, naturally enough, in mass-scale murder and rape, as it usually does when such a city would fall. 
And that, by the way, is regardless of who is doing the assaulting and who is on the receiving end of that assaulting. That is just generally true of warfare in this period, um, no matter where it is or who it involves. Actually, interestingly enough, there is a Byzantine source named Theodosius who actually celebrates the slaughter of Shondox's population. He was happy that this had occurred. And it seems a little odd at first glance, but you have to remember what had happened at Thessalonica back in 904 when the second city of the Byzantine world had been completely devastated by a large raid and about 30,000 or so people were carried off in slavery. So uh, the Byzantines were very adamant in their hatred toward the Muslims of Crete. But what's weird about Theodosius' account is not that he celebrates this murder, but rather that he's worried about the Byzantine soldiers polluting themselves by raping infidel women. I guess he would have felt better about it had these women had more palatable religious beliefs. So I just find that to be an odd detail. I don't know. That just struck me as a, sort of a strange thing to be concerned with. But I guess, uh, you know, religion must have some sort of physiological genetic effect, according to Theodosius. A lot of these sources, by the way, were people who clearly needed to go outside more often. Once the Byzantine troops had had their fill of wine and women, Nicephorus Phocas was able to restore order, get his men back in line, and then he engaged in a careful division of the spoils. About one-fifth of what was taken from the city of Shandox was reserved for the public treasury. This would aid the empire in any future endeavors that it might have to undertake. Phocas was also entitled as the victorious general to select the goods and captives he wanted for his triumph back in Constantinople. As for the Emir Korupas and his son Anemos, they were captured and they would be brought back. They would be part of this triumphal procession. The remainder of the spoils, despite the fact that much of what had been taken by the Emirate of Crete over the years had come from Byzantine subjects, went to the troops rather than back to civilian communities, even when you could identify where it had originally come from. So, uh, to the victors go the spoils in the most literal sense. This was actually a very long-standing Roman tradition where Roman troops were always entitled to plunder from any kind of victory. So this was a pretty much time-honored and ancient tradition by the time of Nicephorus Phocas. In my previous video on Romanus II, when I covered this topic, I unfortunately made the decision to follow the judgment of John Julius Norwick, who said that Romanus II only granted an ovation to Nicephorus Phocas, and that this had contributed to there being a grudge between the two men. However, Norwick was entirely mistaken on that point, and by following him, I replicated an error. So consider this my retraction on that point. In fact, it was a common thing by the 10th century for the Byzantines to celebrate triumphs. They had revived this ancient Roman tradition and they had Christianized it, but it was still basically the triumph of old where victorious generals would get to parade through the streets, display their spoils, and then there would be religious uh, symbology. Mostly it would all be Christian, of course, rather than the captured gods of whatever enemy the Romans had just taken out. So uh, Nicephorus was really into this, and he did get a triumph for his efforts in Crete, and he later also got one for Cilicia. Both of those were prior to him taking the throne, by the way. Uh, the one in Cilicia, he didn't ha get to actually celebrate in time, but he was awarded it. So at any rate, um, the whole idea that Romanus only gave Nicephorus an ovation and thereby stiffed him out of some sort of jealousy or possible fear of allowing Nicephorus to become too prestigious. That was a narrative that I tried to um, promote in my previous video. Clearly that is mistaken and wrong, so I'll have to repeat this point again in my video on um, Nicephorus Phocas. But just in case you watched that previous video on Romanus II, I want you to be clear that what I said in that video was actually wrong. 
Now that Crete has been conquered, let's explore the aftermath. We'll start with the two most prominent captives who came out of Crete, Karupas and his son Anemos. It must have been quite an ordeal for Karupas. He had just lost his emirate and his family's little fiefdom. But he was actually treated pretty well, despite having to partake in a triumph by a foreign power which had a different religion. After having gone through the triumph, he got an offer from Romanus II, and he was granted a generous estate. Not only did Romanus give Karupas a distinguished and um, comfortable retirement, however, he also wanted to incorporate Karupas into the Byzantine political order. Supposedly, there were negotiations between Romanus and Karupas where Karupas would have been able to join the Senate in Byzantium, or in Constantinople, excuse me, had he only converted to Christianity. But Karupas was not willing to go quite that far. He was determined to retain his Islamic faith, and therefore he never ended up becoming a senator. However, his son Animas was more amenable to this suggestion. He did convert to Christianity. He joined the Byzantine army, and he died in battle fighting under the command of John I Zemiskis in 971. Animas' descendants, though, did go on to become a prominent aristocratic family in the Byzantine world. They joined the so-called military aristocracy, those families which had massive landed estates and served as generals again and again, kind of like what we saw with the Phokas family going into this video. The Byzantines, when they conquered Crete, did not just want a strategic foothold in the Aegean and reclaim an ancestral part of their empire. They were intent upon erasing the memory of the Islamic rule over Crete and making everyone forget that it had ever been a thing. And they were pretty effective at doing just that. The Byzantine conquest of Crete effectively spelled the end for the island's Muslim population. Most of the surviving Muslims were enslaved, expelled, forced to convert, and or forced to serve in the Byzantine army. I assume a handful of people were able to do a kind of half-hearted conversion and continue to do what they wanted in private, but for the most part, Phokas himself oversaw this operation and he was known for his thoroughness and also his very severe brand of Orthodox Christianity. One Muslim source, Vaya of Antioch, says that Phokas systematically destroyed all of the mosques on the island of Crete and that this action so greatly enraged the Muslims of Egypt that they retaliated by burning churches in Egypt. Most likely this would mean that the Coptic church suffered because of something that an Orthodox Christian general did, so I don't know if it's entirely fair as a reaction, but um, such is the nature of religious warfare and it rarely makes sense, at least from a modern perspective. When it comes to the Christian subjects of Crete, both the ones who had always been Christians and the new converts, Crete continued on and was fully reintegrated into the Byzantine world. By 1000, Crete was a theme with its own strategos, and it was contributing to the furtherance of imperial aims. Soon after the conquest, a traveling preacher named Nikon arrived on Crete, and he stayed there for seven years. Nikon gained the nickname of Repent because that was the thing that he really liked to shout at crowds of Cretans, and his worry was that long exposure to Islam had corrupted the religious beliefs of the native Christian Cretans. Nikon also encouraged church building and apparently enjoyed some success in that endeavor and got people to shell out money to build new churches and to renovate the existing ones. And partly because of Nikon and partly also because of Phokas's earlier efforts, one interesting fact about the Emirate of Crete is that despite lasting for about 140 years and being very rich, it has left no archaeological trace. The Byzantines committed themselves very firmly to eliminating all traces of it, and they did so in a surprisingly thorough way. 
We normally think of medieval states as being not super effective at um, these kind of large-scale undertakings, but in this case, the Byzantine Empire was quite thorough in what it set out to do. By allocating so many field forces to Crete, the Byzantines had left themselves open on both of their major fronts for over a year. Now, the expedition had succeeded, but had the gamble been worth it? Well, in short, yes, most definitely. Crete effectively shored up the southern Aegean and made it far harder for Arab fleets to hit Aegean coastal cities. This is also coupled, as we'll see when we get back to Nicephorus II Phocas, with an expansion down into Syria, so the Byzantines began to capture coastal areas from which Arab forces could launch major raids into Byzantine territories. This meant that the Byzantine Aegean was far more secure. This, of course, would have a positive impact on coastal populations and trade and prosperity in general. However, this process of recovery was actually pretty slow. In one case, the island of Kithara, which had been abandoned for a while, was only resettled well into the 11th century by settlers from Laconia. One reason I include this fact is because originally Kithara was settled by people from Laconia in the archaic or early classical period. Actually, it'd have to be archaic now that I think about it. But at any rate, it is interesting how on rare occasions history does repeat itself. Anyhow, um, clearly this was worth the risk and this would lead to a recovery of Byzantine power that would not have been as possible or as thorough without Crete being within the empire. Let's now turn to the man of the hour, the conqueror of Crete, Nicephorus Phocas. For most Byzantine generals, even the great ones, the conquest of Crete after so many previous failures would mark the apogee of their career and something that they could happily hang their hat on. However, for Nicephorus Phocas, while this was hardly his first rodeo, the guy was already middle-aged and had won many battles, this really was more of a coming out party than his last hurrah. Although he was contemplating retirement by this point, he wanted to become a monk, this victory made him an empire-wide hero and he would be called upon to follow up this victory with further successes against Saif al dawla in the east, which he would do. He had done enough in Cilicia to earn a second triumph, but then in 963, young Romanus II randomly dropped dead after a hunting expedition. With um, Romanus dead, Nicephorus Phocas was by far the most famous man in the empire. Romanus's two young sons, Basil II and Constantine VIII, were small children and were clearly unable to rule in their own right. So, Nicephorus was expected, or at least he decided, to step in and serve as guardian until such time as the boys could come of age. In the meantime, he went on to win further battles and solidify his name as the White Death of the Saracens. Without his guardianship of the boys, which was followed by one of his colleagues who assassinated and replaced him, it's hard to imagine the lives of Basil II and Constantine VIII. A less scrupulous man may not have allowed the boys to reach adulthood. So what I'm saying is that it is possible that had history gone differently, had Nicephorus not managed to conquer Crete, not only might we not have seen the resettlement of Kithara, but we may have also not seen the reign of Basil II occur, or at the very least it might not have gone as well as it did. Not to mention the material impact that Crete had on the careers of Basil and later emperors, since it was able to provide sustenance, support, and security for the empire the way that it did.